So uh, I actually appreciate a lot of your comments on uh, different storage, different vendors, different arrays, different kind of classifications. Um, and I think it's spot on that there are various different workloads or applications that make a lot of sense for certain configurations. Um, and so Howard, I'm actually going to actually have to say, I believe there are needs for lower, per, uh, not lower performing, but lower feature set arrays. There's still a spot for those. I think they're going away. I think they're becoming commoditized. The cost of higher end arrays are coming down. It's going to encroach on that. So I think that's coming, that they'll actually disappear. So <clears throat> one of the things that we were talking about is uh, the different technologies that are available. Uh, this is kind of just a quick snapshot. I'm not going to read through all of this. But uh, kind of pointing out a few things. You got your DRAM, your NAND, your rewrite. Uh, resistive RAM, PC RAM, and SDT. All of these have different functionalities, they have different costs, they have different performance, they have different features that make them work in an array in different areas and in different cycles. A um, couple of the highlights, uh, obviously speed, everyone can kind of look at that and say, ah, we know things are faster, things are slower. That makes sense to put them in a different spot in the array or get the array to understand what those are capable of and making them used for the workload that best suits them. DRAM, good example. Everyone uses DRAM as read cache in their arrays. It's not necessarily uh, persistable, so no one puts write data in it and says, I've got your data. Now we can do, talk about NVDIMs, or you can talk about battery back systems and some of that where, okay, now DRAM can become, with some help, a actually non-volatile tier, and you can start storing data in it at extremely good speeds. High cost, low capacity points for that cost. So that it's got its needs in the markets. Um, as you kind of look at uh, some of the upcoming uh, solid state persistable storage, you're getting into storage that's actually much more capable, much more uh, delivering performance, delivering feature sets into an array. Uh, it's projected that RERAM, resistive RAM, will actually be replacing in about 2018. So that's looking forward a little bit farther, but arrays need to be able to support that functionality and get it into the right area. It, it toss a couple others in here. We've got them up there. If I don't really talk about them a whole lot, you know, you got disk drives, you got 10K, 15K, you got tape drives, cloud. Hey, Kelly, I don't think I can read the scale of scalability line. So DRAM is 15. Wh which line are you asking? Scalability. Uh, top. Scalability top line. Yeah, 15. So it's 15 nanometer, 12 nanometer, less than 10, 25, and 40. So this is today's technology. What level of uh, it's a little no, bit of today, yeah, right. so you know we're kind of looking forward here. Some oh, yeah, of these okay. are projected. So that's oh, what they're. Say, okay. It's what they're talking about that they will be doing and implementing as they get there. So, right. it's a. Th these are mainstream technologies available today. <clears throat> you can get some of these components in samples, and people are working on them. So we kind of have a feel for where that technology is going to land, but it's a little bit more forward-looking. Okay. And kind of to that point, as they come out, they're going to be more niche. You're going to have them used in certain environments and certain, as you put it in an HPC environment for a really high end top end cache somewhere right next to your CPU. Yeah, that'll be where they in initially get deployed. And to the point about everything's kind of coming downstream into main enterprise, uh, those will be coming down eventually. So, so the Micron Intel Crosspoint NAND fits in RERAM? Yeah. So, yeah, there's a whole lot of those technologies, and you're spot on. There's probably six or eight of them that are kind of in this realm that are being developed and coming out now. They're one of them that's fitting in that realm. I don't know all the details of the internals on that yet. We've had some briefings on it and what its capabilities are going to be. But as it really, really starts hitting production, it'll be really interesting to see how arrays can actually implement them. So we've got some samples of various technologies. I'm not going to say which ones. Yeah. We've got samples of various technologies in our lab we're working on to see where their benefits and drawbacks and where they best fit into an array. So kind of the main conclusion here, uh, there's a lot of non-volatile storage. You want to use each one of them for its best advantage <coughs> and not uh, kind of hide, if you will, its disadvantages as much as you can. Cost is one of them, performance is another. Obviously in DRAM you talk about uh, persistability. It's, you got to hide that, you can't really use it in that realm. So the battery backed, you talk about those kind of things. 
Arrays need to be able to handle all of these tiers and all of these storage media to actually be able to function properly in this coming world because they're all here, they're all going to be here. <clears throat> so here's a couple. So you, <laughs> I didn't uh, mention the Intel earlier, but we've got a couple of slides that are talking about, and these are from Intel and Samsung, about how the markets are moving. And these are more current today slides, a little bit forward looking. But you can see some of the differences between NVMe, they're, they're showing a 10x on SATA there. You can see some, some SATA differences here. You look at the throughput, the IOPS, the bandwidths, the latencies, everything's changing. And it's not just changing like, you know, 10K, 15K drives changed. Yeah, you got some bang for the buck there, but not orders of magnitude. These are orders of magnitude. Going from a, a SAS controller out to a, an NVMe PCIe going into it. Yeah, DDR RAMs, NVDIMs, re re resistive RAM, all of that stuff is orders of magnitude different and you want to use them in different areas and the arrays need to be able to handle that functionality. You know, on Intel was showing this one as far as uh, NVMe, it's actually out, it's here, it's functioning. Uh, a lot of vendors are probably talking about NVMe and how they're using it and where it fits. It's one of the lowest latency, highest bandwidth protocols and connectivities today. Multiple different sizes of that. This one happens to show uh, a, a plug-in adapter card, but there's also <coughs> the form factor cards that fit in. Part of the problems on some of these NVMe drives, it, you start talking about fan out of PCIe, because they're really PCIe, so you start looking at how many lanes can you get to drive them, and how many hops do you have to get to those lanes, and how much power they start needing to actually absorb and hold these workloads. And I've seen a few different systems that are coming out and are hardware vendor designs and implementations that are actually starting to hold a lot of the cards, a lot of the NVMe, PCIe form factor, a lot of the two and a half inch form factor. Power is actually going to be interesting and cooling is going to be interesting as we get into these, these higher density form factors. So that was a good lead in for myself here. So solid state has a different power requirement than actual magnetic. So Part of the problems with getting these really high dense arrays, which a lot of you have probably seen and heard about, and they're out there today, is a lot of the power management. How are you going to get power to all of these? How are you going to hold them up? How are you going to cool them off? The higher the flash capacities, the more power is required on that. That was These are kind of differences between the, the two worlds. As you can imagine, you got to hold your chips at least active enough so they're not completely idle. So you don't have to fire them back up putting them completely idle and letting the CPUs spin them back online takes you some time. It, this one's a real oddball, this writes. Writes taking a lot more power and we've run into this in a lot of the different hardware we've evaluated over time. It, it, NAND chips have the race cycle they have to go through garbage collection, however you want to call it, whatever terminology you want to use. That cycle is extremely power hungry and extremely um, heat intense. We generate a lot of heat on cards on any chip when you're actually doing the erase cycles. And that's actually where the endurance comes in is how many erase cycles you can run them through. So it's kind of counterintuitive to some extent. Hard drives generally, you look at them, they're just up and running. They use a certain wattage. You cause them to seek, you're going to have a little bit of spikes, but you don't have as big a spike as these actually generate. So if you kind of look at um, SSDs, an SSD will hold about three watts of power when it's idle. About three and a half when it's well, uh, three when it's powered down, they call it three and a half when it's idle, and about nine to twelve when it's actually trying to do IOs. Hard drives are generally in the eight range, so you know you're at a fifty percent increase in power to get the solid states running. So you really start running into system problems when you start dropping these in. Can you say it again? So basically, you're saying that flash disks, when they're on, when they're doing heavy writes, require more power than hard drives. They do, yeah. Yeah, and if you kind of look at most of the SSDs you'll see out there, if you go look at some of the specs, they've actually got a power throttle mode, or they, you can actually configure the drive to say, don't take more than X. And it's usually 9 to 12 kind of watts that they give you a cap on. Now, if you're only kind of trickling the drive, it's not going to go up into that realm. It's going to probably be very consistent with a hard drive. But when you're really starting to use it and you're really driving workloads at it for writes, it's going it's to consume a lot more power. So it's basically, there's going to be a break-even point somewhere depending on the mix of read-write. 
Yeah, exactly. Between the hard drive and the Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so then you start talking about the densities and how you get to your densities, and if you're really going to have an array really driving hard, you've got to have a lot of power and a lot of cooling to handle yeah, it. We're, we're kind of reaching the end of the era where you can say, we switched from disks to flash and we got huge power savings. Yeah. Because that power savings came from short-stroked disks to flash. Yeah. And <laughs> yeah, it's, a, it's an amazing change because we always were looking at it the other way. And with the densities going up, which I think is on here somewhere, as the densities go up, you have independent chips that you're holding up, which have a certain wattage. So you put thousands of chips, it's a thousand times their wattage to actually just hold them idle. And what about heat compared? I mean, I'm sorry to ask these exactly. quite basic questions, no, but no. what about when you talk about <laughs> how much heat one of these disks is giving off? A hard drive is obviously spinning all the time, there's motors, so it's right. warm. Right. A uh, solid state disk, I mean, is it get warmer or hotter than a hard drive, or is it going to stay generally cooler? Well, so that's part of the problem with a lot of the systems and the system design today is trying to keep them cooler. They will get hotter quite quickly. Okay. So, so, so power consumption is, is directly proportional. Absolutely. Exactly. Yeah, I understand that. So I, I actually have some Viridant PCIe cards that I can't run in my 1U super micro servers. Because the, the air is too thin at 7,000 feet where the lab is for the fans <laughs> to blow enough to cool them. Pressurize your lab. What's the <laughs> I, I literally have an altitude problem that I can't use that <laughs> card look, in that server. It's kind of funny, but if you look back at hard drives, hard drives had altitude problems too. Right. You know, it's they still do. You can't use hard drives over hey, 10,000 feet. Now we got helium-filled hard drives. These Those will work. <laughs> yeah, right, exactly. Those are very well contained. <laughs> so those those have a known uh, capacity of well-known fluids in them. Fluids I call a liquid or a solid, uh, an air, a fluid, a gas, a fluid. So, yeah, definitely the heat is is a concern, and it's we're at that tipping point due to the densities and the capacities we're hitting. We're starting to hit that tipping point, and when we start really driving these, we're starting to hit that tipping point where solid states taking up more power than hard drives. Not that that's a huge issue, other than you now you got to exhaust it. You got to figure out how to get it, get the power delivered to it, and get it exhausted now of the system. So it's one of the, the system things and system challenges. We've been working with. Uh, there's a couple of them listed over there. We've been working with a lot of the different vendors of of systems to help solve these problems. How are they going to get the power in they need, the cooling in they need? What kind of environments are we going to need? It comes down to you need a lot of monitoring and a lot of management too to be able to handle that. And know when, wow, we're in trouble. We need to start adjusting workloads and balancing things back out differently. So, so are you pulling the SSD smart temp we, rapidly? Um, rapidly, I don't know if I'd say rapidly, but enough to know what's going on. But um, it, I would think every few minutes you'd have to hit it. We do. It's about every few minutes. It's about every minute. But we actually know what we're doing and what our workloads are doing and where they're going. So we might actually ramp up or ramp down. If something's more idle, we don't need it for whatever reason, we'll let it cool back down. And so it kind of varies a lot based on what workload we're doing. Okay. So uh, kind of looking forward even a little bit farther out than that, um, NVMe, PCIe, switching fabrics are where this all is coming and that's part of the reason I kind of let in with the power, the cooling, the systems, the heat. When you really get into this realm, you're talking about extreme low latency, high bandwidth connect communications. Uh, in this diagram we show storage over here, we show hosts, show your ethernet's talking out to your cloud, kind of giving you just run down, these would be more consistent solid state hard drives or magnetic hard drives legacy kind of infrastructure here. Kind of a consistent SAN that you would imagine if you could replace the center part with a network or some, sometimes we might replace it with a fiber channel infrastructure. But PCIe is the base behind all of those. So this is really where it's going. NVMe PCIe is a functionality. And there's more of those you can get into a box and start scaling out with. That's where you're really going to see some changes and systems really need to be headed this direction. <coughs> One of the big advantages if you can get the systems into this realm, uh, it's kind of listed over there, you can get a infrastructure where you can manage through a single pane of glass your hosts, your storage, everything you've got. Scale in kind of functionality. 
range. So one of the other advantages here with this PCI fabric is your, your host connectivity can now start sharing the PCI fabric and do less work on I have to replicate my data, less work on I have to communicate over a LAN. You know, these, these communications used to kind of come out through the LAN. LANs are connected to PCIe, but then they convert and they change protocols and they're, they're slower, much slower at getting between the communications. Here, you can actually get RDMA kind of functionality with the PCIe functionality. You can directly access partner memory, grab what you need. A lot of software needs to be there to coordinate all of this and get the communications done so you don't blow other machines up because you can actually truly have access to them through these. So. Uh, when you start talking about that where you've got a lot of hosts and a lot of storage and a lot of devices and they're all sharing this fabric, the QoS functionality to be able to maintain and control that fabric and get everybody to communicate well and be able to squelch noisy neighbors and quiet it all down and get the system to perform with predictable is actually even more important in these areas. So you've got a lot of locking infrastructure that needs to be optimized across multiple compute domains. So <clears throat> these kind of designs and this new new system implementation that's coming out, I, I know of a couple of different vendors that have some of these up and running in about 64 compute domain, it's 5U, 64 compute domains. They have storage ability, compute ability. You can kind of toggle them back and forth and balance whatever you need to do. Imagine the ability to say, okay, great, storage isn't running fast enough, plug, you know, convert this one to a storage node, or storage is fine, I need another host node, just convert them on the fly. So it's really a scale in where you can functionally do all that you want. It doesn't obsolete legacy protocols. You can actually still connect these in. If your storage vendor has got the functionality, you can tear in and out. You don't have to walk away from, from your traditional storage. So this is an example of one of those. So this is DSSD. It's um, less software around it as far as the functionality of snaps, thin provisioning, you kind of go through that whole data set. And this is one of those, I would call it more purpose-built systems. It doesn't need all of that for the environment it's after. It has a lot of solid state, a lot of speeds, a lot of feeds. Kind of a niche market, if you will, but very good market, pretty good margins on it. What's happening with the new scale-in style of technology, though, you end up with vendor, array vendors bringing you all of the data services, all your snaps, your thin provisioning, your dedupe, all of that functionality back into the table where you can actually do that same thing over the PCIe infrastructure. So I think DSSD is a good example of something that's using the PCIe technology and what's coming down the road as, a, as the advancements are coming. I think all of the vendors should be moving that way and PCIe has been one of our cores from, from day one for us. I particularly like this quote. I don't know if you guys have seen that before, but innovations in hardware and software are very simple. <coughs> hardware speeds up, software has to catch up. Software gets ahead, hardware has to catch up. They're very cyclical as things change. So NVMe is kind of a hardware change as far as the connectivity goes, but the software needs to be there to use that and bring that functionality around and actually make it extremely useful. Just the hardware in itself, helpful, hardware and software, you're really talking some good benefits there. So, so maybe I missed this. Kelly, what's yep. a scale-in architecture? So I'll jump back here one. So this type of an architecture where you have, let's <coughs> converge or hyper-converge where you're kind of getting everything all in one package design. The scale-in is over a PCIe fabric. So you're extremely low latency, uh, extremely but high bandwidth. the DSSD bandwidth. is a, a PCIe fabric kind of solution anyway. Exactly, exactly. So this is one of them. This is a scale in oh, okay. style, yes. All right. Yeah, I wasn't saying it's not. It is. It's one of the designs that's headed there and that storage vendors should be headed there for all of them in that design. So yeah, it's, a, it's an example. It's not as full featured rich as you will uh, yeah. with all of the thin provisioning snapshots. Just go down the list of things. No, none of these things are, you know. A, right. A, a new back end technology or a new interconnect comes out and the storage systems that support it are very basic because they were designed to support the new thing. Right. And then they add features at the same time as the old guys add whatever was new to their old systems and eventually we reach the point we're at with AFAs now where, you know, an AFA has to be a good array to be usable. Yep. Yeah. 
So it is a good system. It's a good design headed to the future, and so they've got some functionality up and running there. I don't know if you guys have done any of the research on the DSSD and gone and seen what they're talking about there. But they There's don't some... return my phone calls. Oh. <laughs> You know what? Mine oh, neither. Wrong people. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay, good. So For now we got. <laughs> <laughs> you got. You got a checkbook. <laughs> yeah, that's, yeah, so they should return your calls. So, but it, one of the things they had is just exactly what we were talking about earlier about the power and heat and cooling aspect oh, yeah. of these. I don't know if you guys have seen some of the problems they struggled with on that. So. That's going to be one of the next challenges for actually getting large, large scale, more dense. You know, if you start getting a little bit less dense, you got more airflow, you got more ability to cool, you got more ability to get more power in. But these dense, dense form factors is a real challenge for power and cooling. So that was all of what we had for our technology. Here's a lot of questions, comments. Uh, we had a little bit of them on the way. For either of us, we can either field them. I think the biggest product, biggest question from the crowd is, so what do you do now? <laughs> Which That's hopefully is the next section. <laughs> <laughs> Otherwise, George has got some tap dancing to do. <laughs> I brought my metal sole shoes, so good we're good. Yeah. How about just you know, observations of what's you know going on in Flash from a technology standpoint, trends, etc. Well, I find I find the whole rack scale switched PCIe thing fascinating. Um, you know, and and there are several others I've talked to. In addition to DSSD, mm -hmm. and it's just you know that's going to be our new definition of tier zero. It's like here's the rack, and the workloads run on the servers at the top of the rack, and the bottom of the rack is full of flash, and we've got latencies of 100 nanoseconds. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. um, you know, that, that's going to be what TMS and violin memory were 10 years ago. And of course, you know, tomorrow's tier zero is today, tier, today's tier one. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, um, I find that really interesting. That's part of the reason that's, that storage array vendors really need to keep in your tier zero, tier one functionality, really need to keep on top of these and really need to design for the future and keep the architectures for the future. So we've been doing PCIe solid state from day one. We designed a stack around that with the intent of we know some storage is orders of magnitude faster than others, has different characteristics, so we've We've planned for multiple tiers. It's been an in-tier architecture. I've probably talked to you guys about that before. We've been an in-tier architecture from day one. 